This is only okay. the second time we've done a full zoomage to a broadcast of trying to do fancy things with OBS. Uh, we do want to start right on time. So <laughs> yeah. I think uh, everybody who's joining is already a Monogram customer. You know Monica, you know I'm Graham, that's the Monogram. Uh, we've got some great coffees. I don't know if anyone's tasted yeah. them yet, uh, but let me give you a quick overview of how I think this can work depending on how committed you're going to be. Some people have got cupping bowls out and they're probably going to copy this technical cupping method uh, the way we're going to go with it. There might be some people who are just auditing the course and just want to watch to see how we do those sorts of things, uh, want to taste the coffee on their own somewhere in the future. Mm -hmm. Or there might be people that would like to taste along with us. And if that's, if that's you, uh, sometime when we start boiling water and preparing our cupping, there's probably about 12, 15 minutes involved in us getting ready to taste the coffee. That'll be a great time for you to prepare a, a cup of each of the coffees or at least one of them. Uh, so that you can taste along using whatever brew method you have. That said, I'm going to. Well, well, well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to leave and maybe get questions. Mo then. Monica's going to be behind the desk. Uh, we're going to keep this very open. If you have questions at any point about what we're doing, what we're talking about, what we've said, uh, pop it into the chat messages. We have uh, Monica voicing those messages back to us so that we can address them. And uh, we'll go from there. I'll leave yeah. it up to the experts, Mila and Graham. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm going to further leave it up to Mila, who's just going to give us a little overview of the steps in the in the cupping that we're going to take today. Right. Okay. Yeah. If you guys didn't read the blog post prior, no worries. Um, a cupping. What is a cupping? A cupping is an industry standard in the specialty coffee industry to evaluate the quality of the coffee and to uh, evaluate consistency. This goes all the way to the farm, to green bean buyers, to the roaster, to baristas, and all the way down the chain. Um, everything you need for a cupping, you need your coffee samples, your cupping bowls that you're using. We recommend having maybe one or two extra uh, just for dipping your spoon in. Uh, we have two glasses here where they're gonna have the break of the crust. And then you need a scale to weight your coffee, you need a kettle, and water, we gave everybody a third wave water packet to put in this uh, four liter uh, jug of distilled water. And what else am I missing? The cupping spoons. If you're cupping with others, there is a COVID uh, cupping protocol where you need, you each need a mug and you each need your own spoon. You're, you're all kind of at a stay at home point. So you're mm -hmm. gonna be taking a spoon and slurping out of the coffee, rinsing off the spoon and having another slurp. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's yeah. allowed. When we're here cupping across uh, people from separate households, quite often what we'll do is, is sample from the coffee with the spoon, put it into a cup, uh, set that spoon aside, drink from the cup, and then that spoon is never communally shared with, with the cup. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way we'll, you'll see us doing it. You get the slurp right out of the bowls. Okay. We have a question. We have a question from Paulina. She's asking, is it four liters to one packet? Yes. Of the third mm -hmm. wave. Yeah. Okay. One gallon equals about one, uh, four liters of water. We have a four liter jug here, just That's from the cool. grocery store. That one came from Zares, I believe. Yeah. Uh, distilled water. That's the size of a four liter jug. Mm -hmm. uh, one packet in there, shake it up, shake it up. Yeah. Give a little shake one every time you're gonna use it, but one of those packets in there. Uh, is, is what we've done today. And it was our best shot at keeping our tasting notes similar to yours if everybody's using the same water. Water has such a big impact on it. The third wave water is even a little bit different than what we're using within Monogram. So we didn't want us to be tasting something different than you're potentially tasting mm -hmm. today. Yes. Okay. Cool. Cool. Do you want to talk about the treasury while I grind the coffee? Go grind yep. some coffee okay. and we'll see yep. how loud that is okay. over top of okay. my, my Do we want to talk about grind size? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Megan, if you want to pop up the little grind size, is it? Let me know when it's good to go. Okay, we're good to go. Okay. So this is the grind size compared to a brewer, which you can get a PDF of on our blog. Uh, we're on the medium to medium coarse side of grind um, when it comes to a cupping. This helps with the extraction and helps with the time and to bring out all the right flavors. On a Brazza Encore, I tested it, it's around a 20, if you have one of those. And then we're at a H5 on a Brazza Forte, which I'm grinding on today. And then about a 7.5 on an EK43, if you have one of those fancy grinders. Yeah. yeah. 
The most important thing is it's a little bit on the coarser side compared to a filter, maybe a little coarser than a Chemex, not as coarse as a French press. But the most important thing is that you have the same grind in each of the samples that you're going to be testing. So treasury series, and, and why we're excited to share this. Now's a good time. We have one. Yeah. I'm going to wait till you grind them all. Keep okay. Going. Okay. before if we hadn't had technical difficulties today. <laughs> We're all set with the grinding. Okay, and let's start boiling water as well if you haven't already. We're going to be ready for hot water as soon as I stop talking about treasury series. Mm -hmm. uh, the treasury for us was an opportunity to find some very unique coffees. And, and these are unique in and of themselves. Each is a different processing method. Each is from a different part of the world. Um, and these are a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. And that's why we wanted to feature them in smaller sample sizes within a collection. Yeah. Um, quite often what happens in the specialty coffee world is from a farm, if we've got micro lots or different processing happening, a smaller volume of coffee coming out of that farm in that method. And if it's really, really good coffee, it's gonna get detected at the farm for being great coffee. It's going to start putting a great demand on price in terms of who wants to be able to access it. And so it's, it's probably some of the most expensive coffee we've ever brought in. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you guys for supporting that yes. and trying some of this. Mm -hmm. And the smallest quantity we've ever brought in, 66 pounds of each coffee. It's true. Yeah. yeah. So essentially about a half a bag where we would usually buy eight or 10 bags of coffee. This is about a half a bag per coffee. Um, in the first round of, of pre-orders and the coffees that you guys got, uh, we're, we're about 40% of the way through it. We'll mm -hmm. do another round and see where we're going. We had really hoped we wouldn't be in a total lockdown situation and that you'd be able to come in and try to pour over any of them with us. Maybe we'll still have some left when uh, things get a little bit back to normal. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to start proceeding with uh, adding water and the cupping. Yes. While Mila is doing that preparation stuff, I'll talk a little bit about the three coffees yeah. that we're going to do. Yeah, quickly. So you want to pour the water as quickly as possible and you want to fill them right to the rim. Top down shot. Yeah. That's my The kettle's all full. So I'm going to. All right. Mila practices this fairly frequently for us. <laughs> and okay. also fill another cup just for your uh, spoons. Okay. So you can sanitize those in between each sample. Cupping this way is, is for us to explore the differences between coffees. Quite often when we're doing a cupping to select new coffees that we're doing larger orders of, we'll bring in 30, 40, 50 samples, and we'll have at any one point as many as 20 bowls or 30 bowls in a series where we're running down that line to try and evaluate the differences between those coffees. For example, uh, when we're picking out a new Ethiopian coffee, we will run dozens and dozens of coffees to try and decide which one we like best. Mm -hmm. A question. Yeah. Chris McCurdy has a question. He missed what the weight of grinds and volume of the cup. Ah, uh, so maybe for he us. Needs the water. For us, yeah. So you want to weigh how much water you want to fill your tear your cup, uh, put your scale or your cup on the scale, tear it, and then weigh how much water fits right to the rim. For us, this is 120 grams or 120 millimeters. 
then you divide that or you times that by 0 0.055. And that gave us 12.1 grams. Which is in what ratio? Um, oh boy. Good question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, give me one second. Yeah, I have it. Yeah, water ratio is 0 0.055 grams per milliliter of water. Got yeah. It. That making sense? <laughs> You haven't responded yet. Okay. I feel like, <laughs> is it like a tablespoon almost? Maybe two. We did how many grams? We did 12.1. 12.1 grams. A, you know, 220 mil. 220 mils. Mm -hmm. So if, if you take 12.1 and 220, look at that ratio. Yeah, I think it's 8.25 now that I'm yeah. remembering. Yeah. So 8.25 yeah. grams of coffee per 100 milliliters. Yeah, or one gram total. Yeah. yeah. It's there. <laughs> yeah. You can do the ratios. Um, we're going to let those steep a little. Neil mm -hmm. is running a timer. If you're doing it at the same time of us, you'll get to the part where we're scooping it out at the same time. Yes. You want to wait four minutes and then you're going to break the crust. And we're going to go over that in about two minutes. In about two minutes. Yep. I'll talk about at least one of these coffees. <laughs> uh, I'll start with the Columbia. That's uh, That was Treasury Series number one coffee uh, out of the Nariño, Nariño uh, area. Um, this one is interesting because quite often in Colombian coffees, you're into commodity coffees. You're not into a micro lot with a small farm and a small producer. We're into a small producer here that did some experimentation. And this kind of experimentation is what we're always trying to encourage when we're talking to farmers or when we're dealing with importers that can deal with those farmers. So this one is double fermented and washed. I should probably explain the difference between a dry process and a washed coffee. Mm -hmm. When the cherries are picked, they go into a pulper and all of the fruit gets stripped off and then they drop down into float tanks, if you will, that, it, that gauge the density of the coffees. And that's a washed coffee. It's getting washed as it's down in those float tanks. And, and all of the mucilage on the seed gets washed off. And you end up with seeds that are going to be dried on a patio or a screen. There's a couple of intervening ways. This one, for example, uh, did that initial de-pulping of the coffee, but then left it without water to do a slight fermentation. Then they rewashed it take off more of the mucilage, did a secondary fermentation. I think the first one was in the eight to 10 hours range. The second one was in the 12 to 18 hours range for fermentation. For the Colombian? Yeah. Uh, 36 hours. 36 on And the then floor. it was uh, 60 hours, yeah. And then they do a final wash of it and put it out on the, on the raised beds to dry it. Mm -hmm. So it's a fairly labor intensive, much more time intensive process to do that. Uh, that's what we've got going on in the, in the Columbia. That's an interesting way to bring out more fruit notes, more sweetness, get more sugar into the mm -hmm. coffee. Um, I think you'll see it apparent in that coffee. Yeah, while still keeping it clean and complex. The next, as a wash. The next crown jewel is the number two out of yep. Rwanda. We're first gonna we're gonna oh. break the crust. All right. Yeah, we're at four minutes. Cool. So, Graham, if you don't mind passing the cortado glass one. You got it. Okay. So we're gonna take a cupping spoon, the one that was pro provided in your box. Um, I'm not going to go you, you, when you break the crust, you want to put your nose down to the cups. I'm not going to do that because Graham and I are sharing the same one, but this really releases the aroma in each cup. And that's something that uh, uh, people will grade. And then when, when you smell the aroma, you actually smell some of the flavor notes that, that you'll get later on. Get in there with your nose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So when you break the crust, you want to put half your spoon into the uh, bowl and then you're going to go around and you want to be consistent each time. So you want to go about I go three times, I circle around. And then you're gonna dip your spoon to clean it. And then you're gonna go again. And then the last one. And then we're gonna skim whatever remaining grinds are at the top. Quite often there's a little competition for who gets to break the crust. It's mm -hmm. that first release of, of the wet coffee that, that's going to give you the best impression of the aroma. That said, I don't mind coming back mm -hmm. to, to evaluate it after it's broken. And you can come back to it several times, mm -hmm. trying to detect some of the differences already that are present between those coffees. Yeah. 
and then skimming, you're going to take two spoons. It could be just normal flat spoons or it could be your cupping spoons. You're going to work from the back and you're going to come forward with both of them. And you're going to meet right down the middle and you're going to come up and you're going to put that into a, another glass. Then you're going to rinse. Yeah. Sometimes it takes uh, two tries to go. So it's okay if you don't get all of them all at once. Basic idea here is you're trying to take everything that's floating off the top. If you mm -hmm. have to skim at it a couple times, as long as you're not pushing too much under, you're skimming off the top. Yeah. It's going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't skim, you'll get grinds on your cupping spoon when you go and uh, slurp. So, and that's never fun. So. And now we're going to let them cool for about another six minutes. It's usually too hot. So we wait for about six minutes for it to come to a palatable temperature. Yep. I'm often good at about four or five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're going to notice too, we're going to hang on with you as we talk about, you know, our impressions on it. Uh, it's often important to wait until it's fully cooled too, to evaluate what's happening with the coffee as it, as it gets back down to room temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, coffees can really evolve uh, as, as the temperatures change. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a good indication of quality and complexity if a bunch of what you noticed hot is present with some other things as it cools. Um, the second coffee on the table from Rwanda, um, a triple wash. That's an interesting concept. <laughs> that, that means that they brought it in and also did fermentation, but very, very little fermentation between cycles. So they're, they're able to grade and regrade and regrade the coffee as it's going through wash cycles, make sure that they've only got the top, call it number one quality beans, uh, consistent density, uh, similarities for size, and that's what's gonna come out the end. And then it ends up in this case on raised beds again as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeff, uh, Cheeseborg has a question. Um, <laughs> Is the initial water pour at the 195 to 205 range? Yes. So he's talking about the heat, I guess. Of yeah, you want to be water. at boiling when you pour the uh, the, the water over the coffee samples. I, I'd want to be over 200. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And yeah, this is why you also wait about like six, 10 minutes before you it's uh, go ahead and slurp. It's hot. Yeah. Uh, the third coffee here, uh, uh, is, is different from a washed coffee. It's a natural coffee out of Ethiopia. Uh, most traditionally, Ethiopian yoga chefs were natural processed coffees. And uh, this is a fine example. It's actually related in, uh, in where it comes from and who does the farming uh, to the, the uh, Bedatu Jabichu, which is the yerg that's on our shelf right now that we've got a lot more of. Uh, but this, this is a, this is a small set of micro lots uh, where the manager producer of the rest of the farms uh, does his own coffee. Uh, so very small micro lots where he's being very particular about what he's doing, mm -hmm. uh, what he's growing and how it's getting processed. So yeah. really meticulous guy. Yeah. And it's only him and then his 10 other family members that are helping him out. So yeah. it's a very small, tight knit. So natural yeah. coffee as opposed to washed. We talked about washed where the first thing that happens is the coffee goes into a depulper to take all of the cherry fruit off of the seed with a, a natural coffee, sometimes, sometimes called dry processed coffee. Um, the cherries are brought down from the farm, spread out over screens, sometimes under some partial shade sails like you see in, in uh, wine country. And they spread them out to try and let them start drying. As they start drying, they'll mound them up into little pyramids across the screens to slow down how quickly they dry. The, the issue there is that stuff at the bottom of the pyramid could have a tendency to ferment or to rot too quickly. Mm -hmm. So you come back in two or three hours and spread all of the little pyramids out back onto the raised beds, the screens, and then you repile it back up into pyramids. And as long as the sun is up, you have to do that every two, three hours. <laughs> You're going to do that for anywhere from 16 to 30 days. Uh, these are in the, the high 20s, this coffee, in mm -hmm. terms of how many days they were doing that process until they bring that moisture content in the, in the, the 
fruit part of the, the cherry uh, low enough uh, to think that it's, it's going to be a, a good quality. Quite often, uh, they're testing, bringing coffees off at different stages in different seasons uh, to test under shade, under full sun, uh, how long they go in terms of where they bring the moisture content down to. Uh, all of those have really big impacts. A natural processed coffee that's over fermented, that's, that's allowed to dry for too long uh, or too quickly in, in piles that weren't spread out often enough can get whiny. Sometimes whiny can be nice as a small note, mm -hmm. but if it gets to the point that it almost tastes boozy, it's gone too far. Uh, it's, it's a fine line towards wrecking a coffee when, when you get into natural processed coffees. Mm -hmm. Once those fruits are a little bit desiccated, the cherries are, are dried out on the screens, they're coming back to the original process down through a, a, a deep pulper, tearing all the fruit off of the internal seeds, down through the washing process to get the mucilage off, and then they have to be re-dried on raised screens as seeds. Mm -hmm. Garrett has a quick question. Okay. Um, might not be a quick answer, but which, uh, what, with such a small quantity that you brought in, Graham, uh, how did you pinpoint your roast? Um, and I asked this question too. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's a good question. And, and it's one that we're challenged with uh, on small batches of coffee. Um, if you guys have trouble falling asleep tonight, go back to our YouTube channel. <laughs> and watch the one hour video we did for Global Coffee Festival on evaluating production roasts through sample roasting. So we have a 50 gram uh, programmable roaster where we can try different profiles. And then the attempt is to translate that, that profile of what tasted good on the sample roaster to the full size production roast. Um, that's always a challenge, but at least you get to work on it with 50 grams at a time. After that, there's a bunch of, if I can say, best practices. So we've, we've had coffee from this same farm group uh, where we've roasted it in the same production size. We know how it behaves. We know what we liked in terms of bringing out the flavors that we were looking for. And then we wanted to make it as transparent as we can for a new coffee that may be similar. All it really means is once you've evaluated, it'll behave the same in a sample roaster and that you like the flavors. When you're on the production roast, you're dancing on that first roast. It's, it's a full attention, full, full concentration, uh, panic almost to try and get it to behave the way you expected it should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank That's you. got her. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. So this natural coffee out on the screens, you can see that all of that time that was spent drying it out for 28 days, piling it up 80 times a day and spreading it back out has a huge labor component to it, uh, but done right, it can be super, super beautiful. So the, the reason we brought that one in, a raised bed natural from, from Ethiopia as a yurga chap, uh, is that it's prototypical for what you're doing uh, in Ethiopia. The other two uh, are tweaks on what is more prototypical for Colombia and Rwanda, washed coffees. Mm -hmm. it, it's worth saying that 90% of the coffee, even we go through here, is, is washed coffee, not natural coffees. Out in the world at large, it's 99.5% washed coffees. Mm -hmm. Even though natural was the first processed in, in coffee process, processing it is. in Ethiopia, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are we at time-wise? Oh, we're good to taste. Yeah. We're good? We're yeah. over five minutes? We're over, yeah. Garrett said very cool and thank you. All That's right. good information. Yeah. Also, when you roasted like the Rwanda, it's in the similar region. Yeah. I think it was a slightly lower altitude. Yeah. Would you use the similar profile from our drama to this one? Yeah, one of the things you're looking at and, and when you're into expensive coffees like this, uh, you're getting information about uh, moisture content in the green beans uh, when it was when it was stored and, and packed into its uh, let's call it Gore-Tex bags, the eco liners that we get uh, inside the burlap bags. So we we understand moisture content that was present. We also get information about the density of the coffee. Um, density is usually a little bit lower at lower altitude, it means that there is less compactness to the, the the seed that ends up being the coffee bean. 
And, and when that's true, usually we're applying a little bit less heat in the early stages. We don't want to ramp it up or go too fast through a less dense coffee. That said, there's, there's a very small difference between uh, the elevations and the varietals that are involved here. It's just some of the more careful processing they did with the triple wash and the selection of coffee within that. Um, also prototypical for Rwanda and coffees that we've always loved. Uh, this one is, is coming from the, the shore of Lake Kivu uh, in the mountains that face west. We've had a, a Kivu Rwandan coffee on our shelf I think since our first few months, mm -hmm. um, it's always been a great coffee for us. It, they often call the, uh, the varietal of the coffee there a Kivu Bourbon. It's almost uh, endemic to the region. It's something that has been growing there for such a long time. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about varietals at the end if you're really interested. <laughs> but let's taste a little bit of coffee. Yes. We're going to be doing our... Uh, our own cupping protocol. Yes, the SEA modified, so yes. where we don't have any contact Absolutely. with the, yeah. If you wanna go first. I'll go first. So we're gonna try the Colombian first. I'm gonna take a couple <laughs> scoops of this for myself. Yeah, you don't wanna to go too low into the cup where the grinds are, you just wanna skim right off the top. And then you're going to rinse your cup. Yeah. Rinse my spoon off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Your spoon. Sorry. A little towel to knock off the extra humidity. Yeah. If you're using a spoon, <laughs> you're going to be doing a slurpy thing. You want to aerate the coffee. Um, I, if, if you're not making a little bit of noise, you might not be doing it right. Mm -hmm. We're in uh, tighter cups than an open spoon, so it's a little harder to aerate <laughs> fully, but. <laughs> bring it bring it out to the sides of your mouth make mm -hmm. sure that it coats the entire surface of your mouth while it's getting a little bit aerated on the way in mm -hmm. oh that's beautiful <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to have you guys jump in on tasting notes yeah um, when when we've evaluated this in the bowls and on some of our pour overs we're into some red grape notes. We've got uh, orange blossom. That's that's a hard one to describe from a tasting note, but you know there's orange, but it's got this this more ethereal sense to the the orange note you're getting. It's not like you're biting into an orange. Uh, we get a little bit of plum. That that's the deeper red fruit note that hopefully you're tasting. Um, chocolate certainly there in most Colombian coffees. Mm -hmm. Yes, a and little, caramel. Base as well. note. The sugar that, or the sweetness we get here is, is in that uh, caramely sense. Mm -hmm. and, and we said there was a coating body to it. And you're gonna see a difference in the mouth feel across these cups. Mm -hmm. Well, Cam Crosby, who um, this is a wonderful <laughs> coffee person, a fan of ours has said, it's all good. And he's already at number three. Oh, wow. All right. So <laughs> he's loving all of them. Um, Does he have a favorite? Set up along a little bit, but thanks Cam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. If your spoon is clean from the first coffee, let's slurp a little mm -hmm. bit of the second one. Some things to look for when you are tasting or to taste are acidity, body, sweetness, um, balance, and that all kind of ties together. William Law has certainly uh, tasted the light grape and floral for okay. sure. I think he's talking about the Columbia, the number one. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're, we're trying to take our time between bowls. When we're doing 30, we tend to run them really quick. <laughs> yes. So that we can come back down and eliminate a bunch and resample the good ones. <laughs> Put a, a tasting circle for everybody or not? No, we have tasting wheels yeah. that we use. Uh, we have one here behind Graham. It's the company uh, Counter Culture Coffee. They invented one. And then SEA reinvented their flavor wheel in 2016. Uh, and then, so there's that one that you can also look up on the internet. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll send you some links if everybody's mm -hmm. interested, uh, everybody who got in on this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, Counterculture also actually reinvented their flavor wheel, I think back in 2020. So this one you can get off their website. There's a PDF of it. 
Go down to the top, oh, down sorry. on the cups. Yeah, let's see if we can try and. <laughs> Let me try and show it off. Mm -hmm. uh, it basically, and it's similar to SCA and counterculture, you're grouping and then subdividing areas of flavor notes. And, and we've got fruit notes, some of the sweet notes, whether or not nuts or chocolate or spices or savory notes are present. Mm -hmm. and, and it can help visually to be looking at, oh, I know there's a red fruit note. Where in there do I think? It, it can help you associate the flavor yeah. uh, just by looking at, at suggestions about related notes. Mm -hmm. I personally prefer the, this one, the counterculture one over the SA one. I do too. Just because there's more, there's more adjectives and they go into body descriptors and other ways to describe the coffee as well. We're going to taste the second one. We've put a little bit of the Rwanda into yes. our cups. I'm going to give it a slurp. So William Law, not to jade anybody, <clears throat> but he's saying Rwanda, he's getting some sweet citrus and very juicy with okay. that Rwanda. Yes. And I yeah. say for sure. Mm -hmm. It's got some beautiful fruit notes to it. Yes, yeah. Where's our note? We're definitely that? getting orange right here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We said spiced wine, and that was something that we picked up more in the uh, in the pour overs than we picked up in the cupping bowl. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting one that we thought about putting a tasting note of this, the white pepper note that's present. It's it's one that we tended to perceive in the linger of the cup that, mm -hmm. that after you slurp and you're just thinking about how the aftertaste lingers with you, we got this little bit of a peppery note. We didn't want it to be a black pepper. It was, yeah. it was bright and light pepper. So we called it a white pepper. Mm -hmm. There it is. Yep, even yeah. in the cupping bowl, I'm tasting it too. It just kind of lingers in the back of my throat, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're saying a zesty body. That's gonna agree with, with William on the, the citrus notes. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we'll describe a zest as being that, that pithy, bitter side uh, that goes along with the fruit note. Yeah, I'm going to take more just because it's good. Nice though. Yeah. And as it cools, I'm getting that tart cherry as well that we were describing. Yeah, a mm -hmm. little, little bit of tart cherry. Mm -hmm. That that part that comes down the, the outside ridges of your tongue is is especially towards the back, a little bit tart there. Yeah. Okay. We moving on to the Ethiopian? Let's move on to the Ethiopian. This one's my personal favorite. Well, we would <laughs> We would never actually evaluate a bunch of coffees, putting washed coffees and natural coffees together on no. the table. Natural coffees tend to jump out for being the sweetest, most juicy thing on the table. And it can, it can cause you to Be less dull. favorably view some of your washed coffees. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll always evaluate natural coffees alone in a series and mm -hmm. all the washed coffees separately alone. Yeah. Or have the naturals at the very end. Yeah. Yeah. A year. I just always love good years. <laughs> Today I'm getting more of a strawberry than a blueberry mm -hmm. note. I agree. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. In the pour overs, we get a little bit more blueberry than strawberry. Yeah, and white peach. Those two notes, strawberry and blueberry, are almost interchangeable with some people. Mm -hmm. If you grew up without eating blueberries and you will only tasted strawberries, you will probably never taste blueberry in anything. You'll always think it's strawberry mm -hmm. and vice versa. <laughs> if you've had both, you can be conflicted about which one you're tasting because it's not the chemical composition of a blueberry or a strawberry. It's a chemical composition that is evoking a correlation in your brain. Uh, so the things that you favor will tend to be the ones that come forward for you, mm -hmm. but definitely a little bit more strawberry yeah. today. Yeah, a great way to practice your sensory skills is actually look at a flavor wheel, go to a grocery store and buy everything that you can find. <laughs> Try and group them though, maybe one day only buy the berries, another day only buy the citrus yeah. and really taste them and even taste the skin of like the of like citrus fruits yeah. to really get like the zest and stuff, yeah. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A little bit of white peach. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sweetness. So this one, and it, it's worth noting too, if, if this is the first time you've done an open cupping bowl, pulling stuff out with a spoon, we're at a much lower extraction, if you will, than we would be if we're brewing the coffee. So it's all of a lighter body, of a lighter composition and total density of coffee uh, than when you're doing a pour over, a Chemex, mm -hmm. French press, coffee machine, any way you're making coffee, it's going to be a stronger cup than what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. But we, we need something that will be consistently evaluatable uh, across any coffee we bring in and that is similar to anything anybody else is doing out there in the world uh, when they're evaluating the coffee so that we're on the same the same field as them when when we're making decisions. Because they do this at the farms too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And roast. All the way down the chain, yeah. It was it was really nice when I first got uh, our first version of the 50 gram uh, sample roaster. Uh, I took it with me to Nicaragua, and we got to a cupping table with about 40 coffees from seven or eight farms, um, and they said, "Let's evaluate all these. We have these other coffees that we just got in, but we weren't able to get them ready for the cupping table." And and I had brought the sample roaster with me. Uh, we started firing up additional coffees from those farms to evaluate them uh, right there. And, and that, that was kind of a special time. I like that. So we're going to hang out here. We're probably going to dip our spoons as this coffee cools. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful time for questions or comments. Does, I, does anybody have a favorite of the treasury uh, collection? Yeah. 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 Probably like number three for sure, which I think is the Yerg. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it comes to the roasting too um, and sample roasting, I asked if um, sometimes do you get profiles from those farms? I mean, they're used to doing something as well just as a guideline or something, mm -hmm. I don't know. Not so much. Um, the, the roasting <laughs> that happens for samples at farms is pretty remedial. Uh, quite often they're using very old equipment, uh, little gas fire uh, barrel roasters. They're harder to control. I would say that they're good at being consistent on their own roasters, but they don't have the ability to experiment as much as we can with our sample roaster. Mm -hmm. Christy Hansford, like number one, best. Okay. Very nice. Uh, Grant Titus says, oh, can you describe Garrett. the Garrett. difference between, I'm oh, sorry, Garrett, <laughs> can you describe the difference between an under or over extracted coffee? How do you know when you've got it right? Go ahead. Oh, you boy. Speak to oh, you're, boy. Oh, you're no. A sensory <laughs> um, so you have your spectrum of under extracted and then over extracted. Uh, if, when you're under extracted, it's going to taste sour. It may taste weak, depending on your TDS, which is your total dissolved solids. Then as you go, as you have a longer contact time, which also means a finer grind, you're going to hit more of the over extracted. It's going to be bitter, might be astringent, dry, and those type of notes there. Yeah. I'll just add before the next question, mm -hmm. people will often confuse sour with bitter. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a tough distinction to make. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of extraction and how coffee will taste. Uh, so you, you need to do some practice. It's almost worth intentionally under extracting, using too little coffee, going too fast, uh, at too coarse of a grind to get it under extracted. Know what sour tastes like, mm -hmm. grind too fine, go too slow and over extract that coffee to figure out bitter. Yeah, get your cupping bowls out or your cupping vessels and try it that way. And then have maybe one in the middle and try that one. So Jeff wanted to learn the process, so he's going to share his thoughts once he tries all this himself. Okay. Uh, Chris McCurdy, next year, can you arrange trips to the farm so that we can taste them there? Love to, <laughs> if we can get trips going, right? I would love to do a monogram field trip. Oh, yes. Um, and we have some contacts for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. first destination I would look at is the one I'm most familiar with, Nicaragua. Uh, we're currently working with a, a young guy that moved from El Salvador whose family is still there. Mm -hmm. We might all get to stay in the plantation house uh, <laughs> that Che Guevara stayed at uh, if we go down there. Yes. Ryan, um, this has been really fun. Uh, you're a mad scientist of coffee genius. I think 
I, I won't be napping today. Um, <laughs> and I already made a second cup. So thank you very much, Ryan. That's awesome. Beautiful. Chris. Um, Great. No, why are we here? <laughs> oh, that's oh, a lot. <laughs> Chris, how is caffeine, oh, caffeine levels affected by roast region and farming techniques? That's a good question. Hmm. A lot of people ask that, I think. Yeah. yeah, we hear that a lot. People will say, I, I think I prefer dark roast because it has less caffeine. Um, that's or that, light I, roast has more caffeine and yeah. people assume that it's really not the case. Um, when, when we're roasting coffee, if it's sufficiently roasted with enough development time, which means you've brought it past the first thermal expansions, the first crack of the coffee, and, and you've kept it roasting at a declining speed uh, for an appropriate amount of time, it can be a very light roast uh, and it will have more caffeine. As you go into, let's call it medium roasts and even dark roast, you could reduce caffeine by five or 6%. Uh, if you go super dark, Starbucks dark, <laughs> you might be reducing caffeine by as much as 10%. Mm -hmm. So within that family of coffees and, and how they're roasted, a 10% difference in the caffeine. The bigger question there is, is uh, varietal and- The species. And species. Yeah. Because robusta, rob the robusta species it has more tons. caffeine. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah. But a high but not good. density <laughs> coffee of some of the varietals mm -hmm. will endemically have more caffeine present as well. The variability of caffeine content within the, the Arabica coffee that we're buying is greater than 10%. So I usually say find the coffee you like the best. And if you're having too much caffeine, stop before you finish your cup. Uh, don't have as much in the second cup. Drink the coffee that tastes good. Caffeine is going to be so little affected by roast levels that you just need to drink what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And David McDonald, uh, like three, but two is really nice too. Uh, Matt um, said, thank you so much. And I'm going to enjoy Rwanda with a cigar this afternoon. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that one's nice. Mm -hmm. um, Cam is asking, what is cultivar? Cultivar or varietal, uh, mm -hmm. interchangeable words for the, the branch of the Arabica uh, species tree, if you will. Um, the, the original coffees uh, that, were, that were naturally occurring all happened in Ethiopia. So quite often we'll refer to Ethiopian coffees as heirloom varietals, stuff that's always existed there. Um, there are people that will go and search for a new varietal that nobody else has ever tasted somewhere on a mountain in Ethiopia. They might find enough of that coffee to have one cup of coffee, mm -hmm. and that's a cool experience. Back when uh, Spain and France and everybody were bringing coffee to be grown in South and Central America, uh, the first coffee that they brought ended up being the most persistent in Colombia and is still known to this day as Tipica. The Tipica varietal was generally the coffee that was being grown across Central and South America. Mm -hmm. Coffee varietals, the, the easiest comparison for me is to, to compare it to apples. So you can crossbreed apples and come up with a new apple, um, a Golden Delicious and a Granny Smith. You could make a hybrid, but those two do not taste the same. They're mm -hmm. very different. And so we've got coffees that do well in different regions of the world. So for example, in Central America, you're looking at yellow or red Bourbon, yellow or red Catuayi as big cultivars or varietals that are being grown. Um, you've got Kivu Bourbon, which is a very close relationship to the Bourbon that's grown in Central America, but it's affected naturally in Rwanda. Yeah, another good comparison is also grapes when you're making wine. Absolutely. You have red, you have white or green or whatever, and then you have, then some are going to be more floral, more fruity, some are going to be dry. They're grown around different parts around the world. At so. any time, we've probably got 30 varietals mm -hmm. somewhere in our shop. Mm -hmm. So Chris McCurdy, it says, ask just to, this will be a longer answer, but keep it short, I feel. Uh, <laughs> the two of you know so much about coffee. How did each one of you garner the knowledge and school of coffee? So mine start with Mila because oh, you're in a wow. process right now. Yes, um, I've started, I started learning here from Graham 
and then that turned into a passion. And then I have read almost every book out there. I do a online course with Barista Hustle, and I'm in the process now. I'm taking SEA certified courses, and I'm looking to become a um, AST, which is an authorized specialty coffee trainer to train these to train these courses. Yeah. And don't undersell yourself either. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mula has oh. been uh, appointed or asked to rejoin uh, some of the barista competitions within Canada mm -hmm. at the national level as a sensory judge. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, just a hobby gone too far. Uh, anything that you really get into, you can read about, you can experiment with, and then you just get hungry for more. Yeah. Oh, Monica is always asking me to mention the fact that I'm an engineer. Um, I do think that mechanical engineering, which I did very little of before I joined the software world, at least taught me about experimental design and, and has lent itself in the, in the evaluation. The, the, the process of trying to perfect a roast is really similar to a lot of the things you would do uh, in a lab in engineering school. Mm -hmm. Slightly off topic for Garrett, but he says, uh, but do you have a favorite coffee based cocktail? Oh, he's asking. Always looking for some interesting ideas for my bar. Oh, for your bar. That's, that's different. I mean, my favorite coffee based cocktail, and this goes against everything I say about specialty coffee. If I'm somewhere out in a camping trip and I've got a campfire and I'm outside the tent and I can make any pot of coffee and even if I do it poorly and I put some Baileys in it, that's a coffee cocktail. Yes. Some um, mixologists that we know though, and <laughs> some cool coffee cocktails. Absolutely. Yeah, Stacy. Yeah, Stacy's a good example. She's a-, a Sommelier. Sommelier and yeah. uh, cocktail aficionado out at uh, the Alora Mill. Mm -hmm. uh, she had started at Langdon Hall. Uh, it's worth talking to the guys at uh, Willibald also. We've been working on different versions of a coffee liqueur with them. Mm -hmm. Haven't been able to bring any of them to market yet. Mm -hmm. They have a blog post featuring our Mad Cat actually on mm -hmm. an espresso martini. Yeah. Yeah. Also cold brew. Try mixing that with some spirits. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Jeff is just asking, uh, once we find the one we like, can we get more? And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if Jeff means with this. Uh, special right so I feel like that's probably limited but mm -hmm. we do feel pretty limited there Jeff uh, we may get that request into us uh, if there's one that you would want more of we do want to do a second release so and, and the reason we're doing it as a release we want to make sure that when we get it out to people it's it's in a fresh state mm -hmm. so we don't want to just roast it and see how much of it sells uh, we're going to do a second release of this coffee, which will take us to about 80% of it having been used. Mm -hmm. We want to reserve a little bit of it for our own internal use, just for me to drink every day, and <laughs> potentially for pour overs for customers who want to come in. That said, if we end up with an odd amount at the end, we can put together some 340 gram bags, potentially mm -hmm. uh, using up the last few pounds. Uh, I'd get you involved in that if we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we only bought 66 pounds of each one. so. Currently, yeah. if we roast it, you know, a bunch more because everybody wants a bunch of the Ethiopia right now, then I can offer the, the, the full suite to anybody in the future. Thanks for that. Yeah. And he says perfect. So Jeff, All right. I like that answer. <laughs> Jeff, if I can sneak some off the end for you, I will. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ian has a question. In Costa Rica, I commonly saw honey wash process mm. mentioned. Is this common in the world? Yeah, it's very common in Costa Rica. It's really common mm -hmm. in Costa Rica. Oh, yeah. It's becoming more common in uh, Colombia and yeah. some of the other uh, South American countries. Yeah, we had some Colombian hunting the other day. You want to speak to honey wash? Uh, you can go for honey it. Process? Yeah, you can go for it. Honey, honey <laughs> process, and, and you'll see black honey, red honey, white honey. Mm -hmm. Those are all just timing differences on a honey process. Honey process is just sort of a hybrid step in between fully washed coffees and natural processed coffees. So when you're doing the depulping, you may leave a little bit more of the fruit, keep all of the mucilage intact, and then get it out onto screens to dry with the mucilage on. Mm -hmm. How much of that mucilage comes off or how much of the fruit is left on takes it from lots of fruit and a black honey process 
to really strip down with very little of the mucilage left, which is that slimy outside of the, the seed, which contains sweetness and sugars, mm -hmm. and they're soaking into the, the seed. That would be a white honey process. Mm -hmm. Honey process in general just means that you let it dry in the mucilage for some time. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's Nothing sticky. The, the, yeah, the, yeah. the seeds are sticky. So that's why they call it. It's honey. Yeah, sticky like honey. When, when you bite into a coffee cherry, they're usually really tart. Mm -hmm. they're, you can tell there's sugars there, but they're tart. And, and you'll typically spit out because it's a really coarse, gritty kind of flesh to the fruit. Yeah. Uh, and you're left with the seed that's inside the two halves all wrapped up in that slimy sticky mucilage that part is sweet that has sugar so you'll you'll hang on to those as you're walking around on a farm uh, <laughs> just kind of enjoying that that flavor mm -hmm. Good. yeah that seems to be all for the questions cool cool yeah where are we at time wise but yeah. if we keep this under yeah, an hour i'd be pleased <laughs> Uh, we have some more coffees to roast today. Yeah, we have some more coffees to roast today. We're bringing a new Ecuador online sometime in the next uh, week or so. Or so. so I want to get uh, a production roast done there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, you've ordered from us, so you know how to get in touch with us. If you have any questions, any follow-up that we can help you with, uh, let us know. Everybody who attended here will send out a link to uh, at least some of these flavor wheels that are fun. Mm -hmm. Give you an idea of what we're looking at when we're doing cuppings. Yeah. Sometime in the future, we'll do more cuppings. Mm -hmm. Hopefully uh, in person once we're allowed. We would love that very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have any e questions, email us at contact at monogram.ca. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>